undergraduate journal, <coughs> especially Rudy Batzel, for making this possible. They have done a wonderful job, and I'm honored to be part of this process. Secondly, I'd like to thank Professor Moy for nominating my paper. And finally, Professor Stephenson, thank you for providing commentary this evening. <laughs> This paper, who had a seminar on the international law of war, taught by professors Moyne and Witt, was also influenced by Professor Mazower's course on, history of, on the history of the international order, which I was taking simultaneously, and who first strongly recommended reading Carl Schmitt's Nomos of the Earth. I took him up on it, and the book shaped how I came to view much of the material with which I was grappling. I grew up in a family that raises both the UN and the American flag on the 4th of July. I have always believed in the importance and power of international law. Yet here I was, reading Schmidt and listening to my seminar contest the utility of the international law of war. While I remain convinced that the law of war must be a valid political force, it was reading Schmidt's critique that gave teeth to my arguments, turning them into beliefs. Gave teeth to my beliefs turning them into arguments. And now to the actual article, The International Law of War as Viewed Through the Spatial Order of Carl Schmitt. In this article, I refute Carl Schmitt's critique of the international law of war by placing it in its historical narrative, by examining a selection of international legal documents, by using practical examples from Algeria and Vietnam, and by bringing it into the contemporary context. Tonight, I will read selections from my introduction and conclusion, as well as sections on Algeria, Vietnam, and present-day conflicts. Today, against the background of terrorism and preemptive war, and allegations of torture in Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, it is not only popular to bemoan the so-called death of international law, but also, by way of justification, to assert that international law was never a viable force in the first place. The idea that international law is flawed but necessary, or alternatively, that international law has no importance because it is unenforceable, are both limited and unhelpful. Making an apology for international law in general is beyond the scope of this paper. Instead, an aspect of international law, the international law of war, will be examined using the theories of Carl Schmitt, a prominent critic of international law in its post-1890 incarnation. In many of his writings, specifically the theory of the partisan and nomos of the earth, Carl Schmitt laments that the world order that emerged from two world wars, the League of Nations, and the United Nations has, dest has destroyed the traditional mode of regulation, what he terms the jus publicum europeum, the law of the European system. In this, world, in this world order that Schmidt deplores, conventional war is over, and European civilization no longer arbitrates global conduct. Under this new world order, he argues, international law is useless and even dangerous, a tool of the weak that destabilizes the status quo. Schmidt adheres to the idea of a spatial order, of a world which, in his words, manifests law upon herself as fixed boundaries and sustains law above herself as a public sign of order, law that is bound to the earth and related to the earth. Schmidt's concept of spatial order is a critical organizing principle. Something that is good for the spatial order upholds it. Something that is bad violates it. Despite being discredited as a Nazi sympathizer by his contemporaries, today Schmidt is experiencing a resurgence as neoconservative thinkers and policymakers attempt to give theoretical validity to violations of international law. Schmidt, an elegant, lucid theorist, possessed ideas that seduce despite the devastating outcomes they describe. Because he sees its flaws so clearly, Schmidt's eloquent critique provides an excellent starting place for a discussion of international law. There is a dichotomy between conventional, civilized war governed by international law and unconventional, civil, colonial, or what Schmidt calls partisan war that threatens the spatial order. 
Schmidt argues that unconventional war destroys the international law of war. He says that the modern partisan has moved away from the conventional enmity of controlled and bracketed war and into the realm of another real enmity which intensifies through terror and counter-terror until it ends in extermination. This argument becomes important when considering the contemporary application of Schmidt's language. His characterization of another real enmity, which intensifies through terror and counter-terror, evokes the rhetoric of the war on terror and, valid, and excuses for violations of international law. According to Schmidt, war could ideally lose its criminal character and punitive tendencies. In the use publicum europeum, neutrality was able to become a true institution of international law because the question of just cause had become juridically irrelevant. Nuremberg and the 1949 Geneva Conventions radically altered this structure of neutrality. Rising out of a romanticized vision of resistance and the notion of a just war, the 1949 Geneva Conventions include partisan, unconventional fighters under the category of combatant who are due prisoner of war status and protections. The standard for combatant status was still quite high, and it was not until the 1977 Geneva Protocols that partisans were more loosely and realistically defined and protected under the law. However, this raises other problems. Partisan fighters are protected perhaps even privileged under international law at the expense of the conventional forces of more powerful nations. And international law is enforced by a consensus of these more powerful nations. If these nations see that abiding by international law is not in their best interests, what mechanism can ensure the integrity of international law? For Schmidt, this gaping logical hole undermines the whole framework of international law. He argues that by its very nature, international law cannot contain the partisan. Therefore, the Geneva Protocols are illegitimate. However, neither Schmidt's analysis of a logical disconnect in the laws of war, nor government's use of this logical disconnect to justify the violations of the laws of war, take into account important developments between 1949 and 1977. Despite Schmidt's theoretical insights, how the laws of war operate in theory cannot be separated from their practice. Algeria and Vietnam are pertinent examples of modern partisan war, counterinsurgency, and global political blowback from negative public opinion. In Algeria, the international law of war made a difference in shaping combat.